Oops. Destroying things. So I will hide behind my computers, uh, so you don't see me so much. So I'm really happy to be here. Uh, I'm always going to Arduino, whether it's in uh, Europe or now here. So it's a good thing I'm here for the first edition. I'm really happy about that. Um, I learned I was going to make a talk here one week ago, so I didn't test it this yet. So let's see how it goes. Um, so we were talking about uh, integrated security a lot uh, during the conference already with the two Chris's uh, that uh, were doing a good job of like showing us the, the, the different stuff. I want to take a different approach here. I want to, to take like, um, to speak about like offensive security. So it will be maybe less technical um, and it will um, concern the, the, the IN uh, reverse engineering lab. So the tools that I will use and uh, what I'm going to do uh, will be similar in a way to what Chris was talking about this morning and yesterday, but at the same time it will be a bit more advanced, I would say, in the term of like how the things are done. All right. So I will quickly introduce um, myself. I mean, so I'm Olivier Thomas, a founder and CTO at Texplain. So we are specialized in reverse engineering chips for uh, all different uh, types of application. And uh, I'm also co-founder of uh, IC Inside, which is uh, a lab. In fact, it's a subsidiary of uh, Texplained, uh, where we basically can uh, deprocess a chip, depackage a chip, take pictures of a chip, uh, and then give that to Texplained so we can uh, retrieve netlist and do whatever we are asked to do with the with the chip, basically. So the idea behind this is like if you can do reverse engineering, uh, you can do a lot, you know. It's not only like uh, what we were saying this morning is like attacking the chip uh, to get like the content out. Uh, but in fact, there's a, a lot of things you can also do like uh, uh, supply chain uh, validation, um, obsolescence management, IP infringement research and stuff like this. So I will speak about that also during the talk because um, uh, you will see on the security side, on the defensive side at least, uh, IC security I think is like uh, there's still some work to do uh, to, to get a, a secure world. Anyway, so this is the summary of the talk uh, here. So if you have time to read it, it's fine. Uh, I will not read it uh, personally. <laughs> and uh, I just want, my goal is to try to start a discussion with you basically about like uh, what with uh, reverse engineering chips and uh, what can we take from this um, regarding security uh, perspective. All right. So we'll start with um, going in the process of reverse engineering a chip. So yes, we'll start with the equipment because uh, we saw Chris's uh, were using um, wet chemicals. I'm also using wet chemicals for what I do. Uh, but uh, when I, when it comes to deprocessing a chip, I also use uh, plasma etchers. So wet chemicals, what we were uh, listening to this morning was like, uh, if you try to deprocess a chip and the tech is a bit small, uh, it's not going to work very well. And the surface will be uneven. If you have empty areas, it makes it, it will create holes and, and stuff like this. So it's not really cool. Plasma etching on the other side is something which is pretty nice, you know, so you create a plasma, so you excite a gas uh, to, to separate electrons and the other parts of the, the atoms. The idea is like, depending on the gas now, you will be able to remove oxide or metal, okay? So it gives you like a lot of um, precision. It's slow enough that you can control and check your result and so on. So that's uh, something that is used uh, in, the, in, um, in labs. But if you do only plus matching, it's not going to work too, uh, to be honest, because it will be super nice, for example, to remove the oxide layers, and suddenly there are lines. And uh, if you continue continue plus matching, you will keep the, the, the profile of the, the line. So as you go down, this profile will get super messy, and you will end up exposing several layers, or maybe not seeing what you are looking for. So the idea is really to be able to combine the different techniques, so wet chemicals, dry chemicals, and also um, chemical mechanical polishing, CMP. Uh, so for me, it's not chemical, you know, I'm not the chip vendor, so I have no idea of the materials that are used in the chip, okay? So I do mechanical polishing only, all right? So this is the, the machine we use for doing this. So it's a, it's a polisher, okay? So you see, for example, here it's a disc with diamond particles that are coated on it. 
And uh, the cool thing with this uh, machine, it has an optical microscope and a five axis arm. Maybe it's even more than five. I don't even know. Uh, but it's, it's super precise. You can polish, polish chips that will be below 90 nanometer and keep going with it. All right. But the key will be to mix the techniques. All right. So as you would see already, uh, the, the, what I will describe is using already a lot of equipment. So next, the deprocessing technique. I was uh, thinking to show you pictures, but then I, I have so many NDAs that uh, it's difficult for me to show you pictures. <laughs> so instead, this is a chip, all right? And what you want uh, when you delayer a chip is basically remove the passivation layer, so the top oxide layer to reach the lines, so you can take the pictures of the tracks. And then you want to basically remove the tracks and take pictures of the vias, and then remove the the the, the 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 vias to get to the lines, and you continue like this until you reach the transistors. All right, and now you take the pictures of all the transistors, and uh, that's your base material. So now you end up with a stack of pictures. I don't know the the to give you an idea. Uh, we have one hour drive per customer basically because uh, when you do a project, it, it can be two hundred gigs of picture, you know, unprocessed, and then you will process it. Blah 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 blah. So you end up with. Uh, uh, a full hard drive. Imagery, optical imagery. So this is a picture I can show. It's an 8051 uh, um, microcontroller, nothing secure. I can buy this on DigiKey just like to give you an example. That's a, a, a picture, an optical picture. And as we saw this morning, if your node is small, uh, basically you're not able to use this picture to trace signals or to find things inside the, the, the chip. So basically, that's not what we, we we use as a source material, but it's already a good thing because you can see the, the memories, the different memory blocks, the CPU, the analog circuitry, and so on. So it's good for having an overview and, and for quickly function map, I would say, the, 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 the IC you want to look at. Same IC, but this time we scan with a SEM. All right, so I think the optical scan uh, was maybe 200 pictures. Uh, the SEM scan here is 10,000 pictures. Uh, the resolution is a bit bigger because so here all the interconnection has been removed and basically what we see here is the the, the doped uh, silicon. All right, so resolution wise with the SEM, uh, you can image whatever you want because you have like a lot of resolution. I think like the modern SEMs have a resolution of something like 0 0.7 nanometer per pixel, which is good even if the, the tech you want to, to look at is, would be 5 nanometer. All right. Then this is where uh, my process stops to be, to be similar with uh, Kristanovsky's process, uh, because what I want to do is I want to trace all the signals first, all of them. Because if I trust all of them, you will see after, if I need to find something, it's going to be a bit faster. So the idea is to convert the pictures you have from the chip to a netlist of the chip. All right. So I took uh, an example here. So I think there's the chip manufacturer name on the slide. It's not a secure chip. Again, <laughs> I was trying to be um, not, uh, I mean, to respect the, the, the secure chips. So what you see here is top layer of a device, you know, it's a, it's a tiny microcontroller. And here you have like the substrate layer of the same device, all right? So basically here you have no interconnects anymore, only the, 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 the substrate. So what we see is basically the footprints of all the transistors that are on the, on the silicon, all right? And what you see here is a, is a tool, in fact, that will uh, be used to extract every features from the from pictures we will take and to get like a HDL model of the of the of the chip. So the HDL model I want to have will be only the digital core. Okay. So I give a tra I give trainings and I say always to to the to the attendees when it comes to analog circuitry and if I ask what is this zone and if it's analog I, I accept two answers which are basically this is analog circuitry or I don't care. Okay. So if you if you want to attack a chip, basically the analog circuitry is not something you want to look at uh, because um, abusing the logic is a, is a, what you want to go for. All right. So 
if you take a chip and you look at the cross section, you will see it's made of layers, all right? So you have to make a difference between the top layers, which are interconnect, lines, and via, okay, a lot of them. This is passive. I mean, there's no, like, uh, it's not something uh, active or smart uh, to, uh, to any extent. So just wiring, okay, dumb wiring. And uh, for, for all of this layer, what you want is basically extract the vias. Okay, so you see, for example, here it's, uh, it's via one layer, and the, all the red dots is basically a polygon put instead of the via. All right, you will do the same with lines. Lines are not green when you take a SEM picture. So that's a polygon that represents the line that was been, that, uh, that has been imaged. And then you want to go to the lower layer. Okay. Because on the low, the, the lower layer, what you will see is basically the transistors. So on this picture, you have the transistors, basically four of them. And with metal one, which is the first layer of interconnect, you will be able to say this is, uh, I don't even know, a NOR standard cell, all right, by just reverse engineering this. A chip, the digital logic, is made of standard cells only. So basically, you have some kind of a library, the standard cell library, with, I don't know, between 100 <laughs> and 1,000 different of those cells, and then it's just like duplicated everywhere on the, on the, on the chip. And that's what you... That's what you can uh, just reverse engineer. Okay, so you will end up with a catalog like this, which represents uh, mainly all the different standard cell varies inside this design. The cool thing is like uh, now if I'm looking at the chip from the same uh, chip vendor with the same tech note, there is a high chance that they are using the same standard cell library. So basically I can reuse these results on different chips. Okay. So it's a one-shot operation to reverse engineer a standard cell. Uh, for those who took the training, uh, they know how to reverse engineer this, so it's not a complicated or long uh, uh, process. But once you have this now, you can go inside your core, and you can find all the different instances of your standard cells, all right? And uh, basically, you just like made a map of uh, what was going on here, all right? Once you have a map uh, of this and you have extracted the standard cells, but also all the interconnects, um, a software can just for you build the, the, the so I use VHDL, should say very log in the US, uh, somebody told me. So <laughs> you can make a HDL model of, of your circuitry, all right? And that's going to be a representation of all the interconnect between the different cells. And this is inside the EDA tool, you know, uh, it's, it's not a part of the software. And why it's important to say this? It's important because it means that this, you can just simulate it. All right? So if you have something you don't really understand, you can go to an ADA tool and simulate what you have just extracted from the chip. It's even better because, in fact, you can uh, simulate attacks. You know, you can change wires like I would do with the FIB, but in the netlist and see if the attack works uh, to prevent any cutter measure to say, no, no, stop, doesn't work. Uh, so I can really work on a, on a model. All right. Of course, it's not the end. Uh, the last step would be to re-archive this netlist because this netlist is flat. Okay, so if you try to read something which is that flat, it's going to be super painful and uh, you will not understand a single thing, uh, I would say. So if you are capable of like going from your VHDL model flat to something which would be archived like this, so now you start to see the different buses and the different structures inside your, your, your device. And basically you will learn a lot. Okay. Um, and yeah, so that's about the, 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 the process. I can show you in the soft how it looks. Uh, I have time, I think, to, to do this. Oh, just went to sleep. Um, all right. I have time. <laughs> so let me switch computers. That's so high tech. I have to say that the first reverse engineering software I was writing was on Mac OS X and uh, the, 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 this tool that uh, we will license um, somewhere between now and the end of the year uh, is working on Windows, which is a bit frustrating for me, but um, what can I say, you know? So here you see, so we have a chip with the different layers, okay? So poly, where you can see the polysilicon, the doped areas, basically. 
the contacts and the polysilicon gates of the transistors. Metal one, so it's the first interconnect layer, tracks only, via one. Metal two, via two, and M3. And you can see here that uh, basically I extracted tracks, via tracks, via tracks. Uh, no, tracks, sorry. Via power rails, all right? And also the standard cells. Uh, it's not, it's not in white here. I don't know why. Uh, but here it is. So maybe I did this on the poly layer only. All right. So this is all the different layers. Of course, what I did was like, uh, what we did. I mean, uh, it's, uh, I didn't do it, uh, all by myself on this one, but this is basically all the standard cells that have been used to uh, design the, 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 the chip. So I put some names sometimes. Uh, basically, if it's an inverter, if it's a MUX with a flip-flop, which is super interesting to have, or latch or things like this, I, I put the correct names, you know, just to have a visual reference. But if the, the standard cell is doing some funny operation, I call this combi, like combinatorial logic, you know, because it's something that maybe I will not uh, use so much. All right? Uh, of course, after we can zoom in, put a model inside and say how it works, basically. Um, but, um, yeah. And then, in fact, after you extract all the features, so this is the, the, so without mouse, it's gonna be tricky. But this is the digital logic of the chip we just saw before, alright? So the, the, this picture, I don't know how, if it's big or not. I suppose it's quite big. Uh, uh, and uh, let's zoom in just to get an idea of uh, how this works, you know? So, the software is working on a GPU that I have to deactivate to use HDMI, you know, so it uses now the Intel integrated uh, GPU, which looks to be really bad. Okay, but uh, anyway, let's move in, you know. You see, it refreshes everything at once. And this is, in fact, our top layers, so only lines. And you see, so I didn't touch the pictures, that's out of the SEM, you know, so it's white on a black background, which is like very favorable if you want to make like picture uh, recognition, feature recognition. And this is Metal 3. Of course, underneath you have like the VIA layer, which looks like stars. Mm, it's pretty cool. Um, M2. So every layer has like a different orientation, you know, and then you have the VIA that goes to M1. And uh, below M1, so M1 and is uh, is one of the layers that is 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 used to to build the standard cells. Uh, but if you look at the poly layer, uh, you will see basically the, the the transistors and the standard cells, and you can for some identify quickly what they are. You know, I see a couple of inverters here. This is a, a NOR gate or whatever. Okay, one thing you are not interested in um, is the those things here, the the big blocks here. This is capacitors and basically it's uh, not something that uh, I would uh, even want to look at or extract or anything. All right. So of course I was saying just before, uh, from this you extract the features. So you extract the, 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 the contacts on this layer. Okay. So uh, this is the number here. Yeah. So this is the number of uh, contacts on, uh, on this layer. So it's almost one million contacts on, on this layer. Uh, almost 200,000 lines. Okay. Whoops. Click twice. All right. And uh, it's also 28,000 standard cells. All right. But I didn't took them all. Um, it's it's still a work in progress, this uh, thing. It's, it's just for demo purpose, you know. So sometimes you are lazy to finish this kind of stuff. So there might be some cells missing here and there. Uh, but um, yeah, this is just to give you an idea. Of course, if you zoom out, you will, uh, you will soon realize that this thing so that's only 30,000 standard cells, uh, but that's already huge. Uh, I mean, maybe displaying the lines wouldn't be a so good idea, but um, just to give you an idea. All right. So when you have this, basically, uh, you just validate this. And if I press this button here, in something like 10, 20 minutes, we'll have the, the VHDL of, of uh, the chip. Uh, and uh, from this file now you can work in an EDA, EDA tool, sorry, or you can use whatever you want, uh, basically. Uh, the pictures are at scale, you can also export the layers and go to Photoshop if you want to trace the old school way, you know, but uh, I, I would I would think it's not the right way to do it. Um, Alright, so I switch to the other computer now because it's fun. 
You see? Hmm? And now let's see uh, what uh, we can do from that. Uh, because uh, it's good to have a VHDL model of a chip, but uh, so far it's it's not super interesting. So the first thing is how do you navigate the netlist? All right. So we were seeing nice pictures with signal trace, and I used to do this a lot, you know, and even like put paper on the floor to draw the the, the schematic, you know, which is uh, a bit uh, funny. Uh, but um, yeah, I can show you maybe like this. Uh, I have here a small tracing tool. Let's call it this way. Uh, so same chip again. So here you can see I have the, the, the netlist. This is the netlist, you know. So if you want to read this and make sense of this, you know, that's going to be tricky, okay, because this is thousands of lines. You see the cursor is just about here. Uh, and uh, I am at line 55,000 already, you know. So reading a, a flat netlist is not something... Uh, that uh, you want to do. All right, that's not a big deal. Let's put this somewhere. Um, so I was doing just an experiment this morning. Uh, it was tough to finish in time. So I just like traced an output of a memory. Okay. And I wanted to know where this output wa was going because maybe if I can, if I can find a latch or a register when I can tamper with the data, I can start to play like Chris was doing like in our code extraction techniques or whatever you want. So let's paste this here. And so now I will trace signals in the netlist like this. All right. So this is basically the, the output of the memory. It goes to a standard cell, which is combinatorial. I don't really care. But now it arrives inside this, which is a flip flop, but also a multiplexer. And now I'm getting excited. So first thing I want to know is like, uh, where are the other um, flip flop? Because uh, I know this is an 8-bit CPU, okay? So I should have eight flip-flops, not only one. So I need to trace, uh, to find, to trace the, the, the signals to find the other flip-flop. So yeah, I think it's those commands here. So if I copy-paste this here and I do this. Now, what I did is basically I followed the, the, the clock back, you know, and then I said follow the clock in the other direction and bam, I have eight flip-flops which is becoming super interesting because now I have a full register and I know where this register is and uh, I can start to, to play with it. All right, so I wanted to know more, you know, so I wanted first to verify this, so I wanted to go back to the memory, basically. So going back to the memory is, is something the, that uh, you can also do pretty quickly. And you see that it's going to the same kind of cells here, so it's a good sign that you're going inside in into the, the good direction. Um, and then I wanted to see more. So the investigate part here is not interesting. Um, tracing back to first cell after memory output is not interesting. I mean, we can do it just for the fun, you know, like uh, doo -doo -doo. a few lines. And in fact, you will see uh, inverters. So I don't have them all. Uh, as I was saying, I didn't, uh, I don't have all the cells on, on this chip, but who cares? I mean, you get the ID. Uh, but then, I wanted to see something else, you know, because when you have something which is a flip-flop and at the same time a multiplexer, we are not far, I think, from a, a scan chain, you know, a debug chain. And this is always interesting to know where those things are. So I just like traced the other inputs. Basically, if that's a scan chain, it means that I have like the regular way of like giving data to the CPU. But uh, if I activate the other mode, now this should be a shift register, you know, and uh, like all those JTAG thing and, and stuff like this are like this. So I, d I did try on two cells to to for, to trace basically the other input just to see what was going on. And guess what? I have uh, to, to do, so I don't know where I started. This is getting messy here. But you see that input A here is going to from one of the flip-flop to the next one, from one over flip-flop to the next one. So you start to see the chain, basically, and you know now the, the order of the bits at the same time, because <laughs> that's a chain, so it gives the order for you, and you can trace this back. Uh, next step uh, on, on this thing, you know, if I want, for example, let's say this scan thing, let's say it's not this chip, because this chip is like super simple and everything, but let's say this is a SOC now, and uh, I found something like this, I would think JTAG, you know, 
and maybe the JTAG would be locked for, for some reason. If I see this now, um, I know that I can trace back the selection signal, okay, in some kind of like deep search kind of uh, approach. So I would say to the tracing tool, follow this signal back, and I want to know all the cells that are in between this and flip-flops, which will basically give me the control logic of the JTAG. Hmm? And now I can start to look for how do I reactivate the JTAG, you know, maybe with like a, a semi-invasive attack or micro-probing or whatever, you know. So, I mean, this is, uh, this is one possibility. And, uh, so then I wanted to do much more, but I got, I got uh, out of time. I ran out of time. So, uh, I think it's just like to give you the idea of like how things can get analyzed, you know, if you automate the, the, the thing to, this extent, you know. Remember, this is only from pictures. Uh, so, all right, netlist navigation. Do do. So, of course, when you do like um, a security assessment, or if you want to extract uh, an NVM memory from a chip, uh, you can use this uh, this kind of like tracing uh, approach. You know, you will get no time to the first register. When I say no time, it's one click, um, and then. If you, if the register is like something like this one, you will be able to perform like a linear, linear code extraction attack and get the content of the memory. All right. So that's one thing. I wanted also to show you another example when you simulate things. All right. And, uh, Chris, uh, Chris was speaking about ROMs yesterday. So I was like, uh, okay, let's put, let's take a ROM where everything is like, uh, it's the worst condition ever. You know, so we are speaking about like small tech nodes. Uh, scrambling for the word lines inside the ROM, scrambling for the bit lines inside the ROM, plus encryption uh, inside the digital core. How do you get the, the, the thing out? You microprobe, maybe? Yeah, that's legit. It, it would work. But um, if you have the netlist of the chip, you can do something different. So I took this ROM, you know, and it's worst case scenario, let's say. You see even like here, if you look at the buffers, uh, and you try to count the, the, the output, you will end up with numbers like 47, you know. So a chip with 47 output for the ROM, you know, doesn't really make sense, you know. So uh, it's just a tell that something is going um, to be really complicated here. So basically, you can still use the tool because you have the netlist of the chip. Uh, yeah, first you can extract the bits, all right? So now there is like some tools available on the web for this, I heard. <laughs> so it, it's good, but let's say you extract the bits, but now you are, you can uh, basically create um, uh, a model of the complete ROM. So here you have like um, all the addressing logic. So basically the addresses of the ROM arrives here in this block. Uh, this is the address decoder. So you have like the, the schematic all, of all of those things. Um, the tracing tool, when it's doing the schematic, it's also doing the HDL of the block, only what you traced, you know, which is useful if you want to re-archive, for example, the, 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 the thing, or if you want to simulate. And in this case, I want to simulate. So now inside this model, there's the scrambling. It's inside. I have no idea of how it works, but this is described in the, in the model. Uh, so if I want to know, I can, I can check, but, uh, I don't want to know. It's, it's okay. The model knows for me. Then I will go inside the digital digital logic, and I will use again some kind of like deep search uh, thing inside to recover basically the decryption circuitry. All right, and if I have all of this now, I can write a test bench for my uh, VHDL model, which would be uh, give first address to the ROM, and the model will tell me what's the decrypted value. All right, and I can loop now through all the different addresses and get the ROM content in clear. I will not know what was going on inside. I will just get the correct data, you know. No FIBs, uh, only pictures. So reverse engineering is cool. Uh, all right. It doesn't stop here for me, you know. And this is, I mean, like, uh, so far it's cool, it's technical, we're having fun. After I will be more politic and we can fight. Uh, <laughs> but uh, um, to me, if... And if you get this kind of, um, of uh, capabilities and the bad guys can and some other guys can, I mean like a lot of guys can maybe, no, it's not so much, but some at least, um, you can do things that are pretty funny, you know. So clock glitching, for example, clock glitching, if you do this from the, in the outside of a chip, what uh, is going to happen is like uh, you will have no clue of what's going on inside, you know. 
I did something, there's a fault, and uh, maybe I can take uh, advantage over it, and that's it. The effect is kind of global, you know, so it's hard to, to pinpoint uh, the, 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 the exact um, chain of uh, events that you created. But now, if you take a, a reverse engineering software, and you follow the clock until it's created, you will see the clock distribution tree, all right? And now I can annotate a few parts of my chip, and maybe this part, this part, is something I want to change, you know. I don't want this to be updated, for example, or, you know. I want to have control over my clock glitch. I want to play with the clock for, for example, not updating a register value. And what I will do is I will put a needle there, or maybe do OBH or some kind of like crazy techniques to just inject an error on a specific area. But I will have control this time. To some extent, this is true also for VCC glitch. To some extent, it's really uh, dependent on the type of device and how it's um, it's uh, mapped. But why not? I mean, why not? So that's one example. Another example would be um, what we call the smart gun. Okay, smart gun is uh, is pretty cool. So, for example, when you do laser glitching, you will take a laser and basically you're fishing. You don't know where to place the laser. All right. So maybe you can just you know test every point of the chip, but make some map, you know, it's going to take years uh, if you want to be to have a test which would be correct. But in fact, here it's a map, so it's again the same chip. In red, you have the sequential logic cells. In blue, you have the combinatorial logic cells. If the laser uh, is on a combinatorial logic cell, as soon as the laser will be off, the effect will disappear. Okay, so you have your chance of actually injecting your fault is pretty low on those cells. On the other end, on all of the red cells, that's registers, you know, that's flip-flop. So if I change the value, now it will keep the value, even if the laser is off. So if I want to inject a fault, I can inject a fault here. Why I didn't show you, but all that is traced also with the tracing software is mapped. So it's cross-reference with the pictures. So basically, uh, if you find a register and you want to play with only this register, you can have a map and synchronize the thing with uh, with this. So I was speaking about the smart gun with a, with a laser, but uh, if you do EMA attacks or photo emission, being able to map things on a, on a chip will, uh, will help you to make sense of your data. I would also advise to build a custom station, you know, like do it yourself laser station like this one. It's pretty cheap. And now if you can uh, link this with a map of, uh, of the, the cells, it's going to be super effective, especially if you are if you use techniques like uh, OBIC, for example, uh, to make the picture of the chip. So that's that's an example. Um, anyway, so let me check the time. Okay, so far, so good. So yeah, this is where it gets uh, it gets uh, pretty bad, I would say. So I call all of, all of these uh, different uh, attacks reverse engineering based attacks, you know, and to me it's, uh, it's kind of a new class, you know. Uh, but if you look at the, the security evaluation um, schemes, you know, uh, you'll be shocked, you know. So I'm from Europe, so I can uh, speak about common criteria much more than the other certification scheme. But basically, if you look at certification scheme and common criteria, you want to reach 31. If uh, your, your chip is ranked 31 or above, it's secure. That's what the thing says. So they also, it also says that uh, your chip will be evaluated against non-invasive attack, semi-invasive attack, and fully invasive attack. But now there's, there's, there's something wrong here. Because as soon as you say, I'm going to try an invasive attack, you already reach 31. I just said it 31 points. So the chip is secure. So the attack is consider considered as a residual threat. All right? And when I say invasive attack, I'm only speaking about microprobing. I'm not speaking about like uh, getting the netlist out and uh, being able to map data and to use the reverse engineering data to build something way more complicated. Okay? So basically, those certification schemes don't take this into account at all. Okay? Even if it's written on it, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's not true. So at the time where you start your attack, you're already at 31. So the chip is secure, you know? Too bad. And we are speaking about chip. I'm not speaking about like a, um, a, a CPU. I'm speaking about like, for example, secure elements, you know, that you want to protect something. 
and the, maybe the sick element is 10 years in the field and after one year somebody can just like do what he wants with it and the uh, end of the game you know but the chip was secure okay so all right don't say too much and don't get angry uh it's okay on the other side because on the other side um so that's the list of uh, some of the services that we do at Explain. But you will see that things, except the design review thing, all the rest is based on the fact that we can reverse engineer the, the, the chips uh, to the point where we have a netlist. And here you will see like different things, and it's not, it's not always security, you know. Um, and people need this, all right? So what do they need? Uh, they need risk assessment. If you are a chip vendor and you want to test your chip, um, in black box situation, for example, um, you, you can do risk assessment. OEMs and integrators want risk assessment much more than the chip vendors themselves. Okay. So this is just, I, I said nothing. Um, they don't trust, in fact, the data sheet <laughs> for some reason. <laughs> and, uh, they want to, to make sure that uh, what they heard with the certification scheme is, is true or if he, if he wants to also know about like the invasive part of things, it's a, it's, it's something that's pretty, pretty interesting. OEMs and integrator wants to benchmark, uh, the different solutions they can put in place, you know, so that's a second thing. And then hacking the pirate's device. So I was doing this with Chris, uh, in the pay TV industry for some years. It's a fun thing to do, but it can uh, give you the opportunity to learn about what the pirates are doing. So maybe you are better at doing countermeasure. I said maybe. Uh, uh, but uh, yeah, that's something that people can want to try too. So that's the security, the regular thing, I would say. Um, but there's something more to it, like forensics, for example. Um, what's with the iPhone, you know? How can I access all of it? You know, it's, it's, it's getting complicated at some point, you know? But the people will want the data anyway. So... What they, they will need to do is basically go to the chips, you know, and uh, try to understand what's going on there, you know, so they can build like uh, super complex attacks to get to the data, you know, because fighting against terrorism or child pornography or this kind of things is something that matters, I guess. And uh, if you need to do this, let's do it, you know, uh, it can be fun. Another thing is compatibility, you know. Uh, so Chris was uh, speaking uh, this morning about printer cartridges. Yeah, you should see how this is driving the, the reverse engineering market, you know. So you will hear nothing about those labs who are just like producing the solutions, but they produce solutions because you can buy on uh, eBay, uh, or sorry, Amazon, eBay, I mean like where, wherever you want, like the, 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 the cartridge, you know, the off-branded cartridges. And uh, the market is huge, like... Uh, uh, the cartridges alone is like billion dollars uh, ma market per year, you know, that's then your revenue year. So if you can hack one of these printer cartridge, you can buy a FIB, a SEM and all that you want, you know, because the first time it's going to be all right, you know. So, and it was driving in a way like uh, the, the, the research in IC security, but it never reached the public domain, you know, <laughs> it's a, that's the, the cool thing in a way. There is other the domains that uh, have this kind of demands, you know, like uh, I listed here automotive, for example. Yeah, what if you want to build something on a car, you know, and uh, in fact, you cannot access anything because like it's all only proprietary systems and you have no access to it and blah, 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 blah. Um, reverse engineering can be something that's cool for this. Looking for counterfeits, I'm not sure I need to go to the netlist for this, but why not? I mean, here you have like four different generation of, uh, of chips that are used in, uh, lightning cables counterfeit. But I just wanted to show you something. Here that's a huge microcontroller. Here it got a bit smaller. Then it got a bit smaller. It's different microcontrollers. So it means that the, 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 let's call them uh, counterfeiters, uh, they just like emulate the system. But look at the last one. The last one is a custom ASIC. There is enough money there that people can start to manufa manufacture their own chips, you know. Why not? Um, and this is what you're after. And if you want to understand what they did now, uh, I think you have to reverse engineer the chips. 
why not? I mean, okay. So then, um, tribute to Joe, cool sticker. <laughs> um, hardware tray and, and back doors, you know, how do you detect those? It's pretty hard, you know? So the supply chain is something that you want to validate, or at least you want to make sure that the chip you, 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 you get out of the factory are the one you design. Okay. It's a, it's a tough, uh, tough question because uh, how do you do this? Like you do side channel with test pattern and you try to get to the point. Yeah. But now if something is wrong, what, what, what do you learn from this? Okay. So I think like I personally think that if and only if you can get to a golden sample, which is a good question. What's a golden sample? Uh, in that case, you can just like take chips, um, delay the chips, align the pictures, and already optically you can look for difference. So optically it's not going to be fun. So take all the features out of the chip and now compare the features. The cool thing now, if you see some extra circuitry or missing circuitry, you have the VHDL model of the extra circuitry or the missing circuitry. So you can characterize what you have in front of you and understand what's going on. All right. So I think it's a, it's a good way of doing this, but, uh, there are other ways and uh, blah, blah. It's, uh, it's so slow to put things in place. You know, it's, uh, sometimes it's annoying. Um, anyway, patent infringement is another demand that we have uh, regularly like uh, oh yeah i think they stole our ip you know they don't pay and they are using the same thing okay but how do you know uh, can you prove it no uh, i can't you know but now if i can take out the ip from the netlist and say look that's your ip in the competitor product uh, some people will get super happy uh, about that uh, so and it's, I mean, like, uh, it's logical. I mean, if I'm building chips, I want to make sure that uh, my things are not stolen, you know, so I want to verify this. Obsolescence management. Yes, obsolescence management. I like when I have a phone call f from somebody that says, I have a chip to reverse engineer. It's one square centimeters. Now I'm scared, you know, because one square centimeter, if the tech is uh, like 90 nanometer or 40 nanometer, that's going to be like, millions of gates, you know, and, uh, I'm gonna, uh, yeah, it's not gonna be fun. But then they say, no, that's 10,000 standard cells. And you're like, whoa, it's a shock, you know, on, on a so big surface. And the, the thing is like the tech they are, they, they are working on are maybe two micrometer for the, the, the gates. So two micrometer. And now we are at five nanometer. Uh, so it's a factor. I don't know. It's a, it's a big difference. But anyway, so we have those system that can be really complex and there's a chip where nobody knows where the chip is coming from. The chip, uh, the chip designer doesn't exist anymore. Uh, about the code inside, nobody knows. Uh, the only thing they know is like, uh, this thing is discontinued and at some point they will miss the chips, you know. So that's also a good thing. I mean, that we can, um, reverse engineer the, the netlist so we can get the functionality, the hardware functionality. It's also a good thing that uh, we can hack and get the code. Hmm? I think it's, uh, it's legitimate in this case, in this case. And that we can maybe emulate the old, the old chip inside the FPGA and, un and, uh, for the customer, instead of replacing the complete board, making a new design, you know, for making sure that the thing is working properly, maybe you just need to replace this chip by, uh, by uh, a daughter board with a FPGA or just an FPGA alone or something uh, that would be Way easier to, to carry, basically. That's all I want to say. No, what I want to say, I want to conclude on this. As I was saying, I want to start a discussion with you. Okay. Because, uh, I, I was speaking only about like, um, hacking chips, you know, and the thing is like, uh, in conference, it's pretty rare. So hardware IO was like mind blowing for this, like at least three, four, four talks, at least about like integrated circuit security. Mm -hmm. Pretty cool. Um, but, uh, it's, it's always offensive, uh, things, you know, I'd like to hear more about the defensive part of it, you know, because, uh, I mean, so at explain, we design some countermeasure when we see something that we can do, but, uh, most of the time, those countermeasure are kept secret by the chip vendors and they don't add security. Uh, we can speak about, uh, shield or S1 puff or encrypting flashes and stuff like this. It doesn't help. Okay. That's marketing. Um, so, yeah, would be really happy uh, to speak with you uh, after the talk and uh, have uh, some kind of feedback about the different application and how you see 
hardware security going and uh, and um, and yeah, that's it. Uh, so thank you for your attention. If you have some questions. <laughs>